Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Leo Frank took his terrible fate with a quiet dignity. As the blindfold was placed over his eyes, he asked only that his wedding ring be given to his wife. Watched on by Atlanta's great and good, he was then hung to death from the branch of a tree. How this mild-mannered young Jewish businessman met his brutal end is one of America's most disputed and intractable mysteries. The only uncontested fact is that a 13-year-old girl was murdered. Everything else remains tainted by a shameful legacy of racism and anti-Semitism that continues to cloud the case even now, 100 years later. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. The murder of young Mary Fagan and the subsequent arrest, conviction, and lynching of Leo Frank would prove so controversial and divisive that it would prompt the formation of two organizations that could hardly be greater polar opposites – the second chapter of the KKK and the Jewish Anti-Defamation League. Leo Frank's high-profile murder trial became a media circus and created deep and long-standing religious and ethnic fractures in Atlanta. For many in the Jewish community, the subsequent guilty verdict was seen as symbolic of the depth of anti-Semitism in the United States, on par with the infamous Dreyfus Affair in France. Prominent Jewish organizations, businessmen, and media tycoons rallied behind Frank's innocence and campaigned to overturn the guilty verdict. Numerous stories appeared in the press which sided with Frank and tried to cast the spotlight of blame on alternative black suspects. Much of the press coverage both against and in favor of Frank was shockingly racist by today's standards, but par for the course for the American South in 1913. In a society built around discrimination, the sad murder of Mary Fagan thus became polarized between two camps of differing but equally extreme prejudices. For those advocating Frank's innocence, he was the victim of the anti-Semitic endemic in American society, in its police and judiciary. For this camp, the true culprit was obviously the violent black man, unable to control his urge to ravage an innocent white girl. Those who believed Frank had murdered Mary painted his supporters as part of an insidious Jewish conspiracy to help one of their own escape justice, tapping into the wider and more sinister beliefs of the time that a Jewish cabal of industrialists and bankers was taking over America. In this feverish atmosphere, stirred relentlessly by the tabloid press, the facts of the case got lost amongst much myth and fantasy suborned and perjured testimony, and outright lies. To try and understand the truth in this murky case, 
we must go back to one Saturday afternoon in 1913, when a young factory worker went to collect her wages and was never seen alive again. In early 20th century America, before child labor laws had made it illegal, it was common for girls like 13-year-old Mary Fagan to take manual work in factories. Before the safety net of Social Security, families like the Fagans often depended on their children working for their very survival. Mary had worked at Atlanta's National Pencil Company factory since she was 12 years old. Renowned in the neighborhood for her cheerful demeanor, she was a notably pretty and popular girl who the previous Christmas had played Sleeping Beauty in the local church play. On the afternoon of Saturday, April 26th, Mary dropped into her workplace to pick up her meager wages for the week, hoping to then attend that day's Confederate Memorial Day parade in the town center. She would never make it to the parade or ever be seen alive again. The factory's manager was Leo Frank, a 29-year-old graduate of Cornell University whose wealthy uncle owned shares in the factory's parent company. At about noon, Mary made her way to his office to collect her money, an encounter Frank recalled later when interviewed by the police. He would be the last person to admit to seeing the teenager alive. Sometime in the early hours of the next morning, the factory's night watchman, Newt Lee, made a horrific discovery. In the basement of the building, he found the battered and bloodied body of a young girl, so covered in dirt it was impossible to determine whether she was black or white. It was young Mary Fagan, beaten, raped, and strangled with a cord cut deep into her neck. Despite his terror that he may be blamed as a black man for the murder, Lee immediately fetched the local police. Lee's worry was well-founded. He was arrested and charged with the crime by police. The next day, a white mob gathering outside of the station with the intent of lynching him. Whilst extrajudicial lynching had declined since its heyday in the 1890s, it was still a fairly common practice in 1913, especially against black men. Even the suspicion that Lee was involved in the rape and murder of a young white girl could have had fatal consequences for him. Luckily, Newt Lee was saved from the mob and later cleared of any involvement. Police set about interviewing current and former workers at the factory to try and find the real culprit. Several men known to have been seen with Fagan in the past, such as a recently dismissed factory clerk, John Gant, were arrested but eventually cleared. On Monday, the 1st of May, detectives called around at the house of factory superintendent, Leo Frank. Although not detained at the time, the officers were extremely suspicious of Frank. From the tentative timeline they had assembled of Mary Fagan's day, Frank was the last person to admit seeing her alive. The detectives were particularly struck by Frank's extremely nervous and agitated manner whilst talking to them. Was this strange reaction from Frank evidence of guilt or simply the reaction of a man with a noted nervous disposition not used to talking to policemen. By now, the mood in Atlanta was one of hysteria. Thousands of people had visited the funeral home to view the dead girl's body. Demands that the murderer be found were coming from as high up as the governor and state legislature. The Atlanta Constitution newspaper even announced a then-massive $1,000 reward for the capture of the killer on its front page. A coroner's jury, accompanied by several Atlanta policemen, had re-examined the factory crime scene and found blonde hairs and blood in the metal room near to Frank's office. Another young factory girl also testified that she had come to collect her wage shortly after Mary, but Frank was not in his office. On the basis of this evidence and his nervous demeanor, Frank was arrested on suspicion of the murder. Another man, the factory's black janitor Jim Conley, was also arrested after witnesses saw him washing red stains out of a shirt in a faucet behind the factory. Whilst Conley gave numerous contradictory statements about the murder, he would later be used as the chief witness against Leo Frank at the trial. The police now had several suspects and lots of evidence. By far the most perplexing and confusing of these 
was two notes that were found near Mary's body. Ostensibly written by Mary herself, the bizarre, broken English made them virtually incomprehensible. The first note read, He said he would love me, land down play like the night witch, did it, but that long, tall, black negro did boy his slef. The other note said, Ma'am, that negro higher down here did this, I went to make water and he pushed me down that hole, a long, tall negro black that who it was, long, slim, tall negro, I write while play with me. One thing was clear. Mary Fagan had not written these notes herself. The basement her body was found in was pitch black. It was impossible in the circumstances for a dying girl to have written messages in the first place. And that meant only one thing the notes had been written by her killer. As the police developed more evidence, Leo Frank became their prime suspect. Conley was now saying that Frank had killed Fagan and he had helped him dispose of the body. Both the coroner's jury and the grand jury unanimously voted to indict Frank for the murder. The trial began on July 28, 1913, with State Attorney Hugh Dorsey leading the prosecution. Dorsey attempted to portray the defendant as a sexual predator and pervert, producing a succession of young women from the pencil factory to testify that Frank had made improper advances on them. Dorsey's ace card was Jim Conley. By now, the janitor's many different stories had become one damning account of how Leo Frank had murdered Mary Fagan after she rejected his sexual propositions and then ordered Conley to help him dump the body in the factory basement. The two notes, Conley told the court, were written by him but dictated by Frank. Conley proved to be an unimpeachable witness for the prosecution, withstanding hours of defense cross-examination with a cool assuredness. Some observers felt Conley's testimony had been heavily rehearsed, almost as if he was reading from a script, but it was enough to convince the jury and Frank was unanimously convicted. On October 10th, Judge Leonard S. Rowan sentenced Leo Frank to hang. Crowds of Atlanteans who had been gathering outside of the courtroom over the last five weeks cheered the verdict. The sensational and salacious coverage of the trial in the newspapers had stoked up strong feelings against Frank in the city. As a Yankee Jew, Atlantans were already predisposed against him, and general resentment was also growing against wealthy industrialists and factory owners who are believed to be exploiting child labor to run their businesses. The rest of America was more divided by the verdict. Whilst widely celebrated in the South, Frank's conviction was questioned in the North. Led by the New York Times, editorials appeared decrying the trial as a farce and an example of the anti-Semitism of the South. Some even suggested that Georgia was not fit for self-government. This narrative took hold, and a campaign group of Jewish civic and business groups set out to overturn the conviction, raising $250,000 to help prove Frank's innocence. Private detectives were sent into Atlanta to review the case, and numerous appeals were lodged with both the Georgian and the U.S. Supreme Courts. In Atlanta, Frank was still widely reviled as a child murderer and rapist, and the high-profile campaign to free him created a great deal of resentment in the area. Tom Watson, editor of the Jeffersonian tabloid newspaper, retaliated with accusations of a northern conspiracy, headed by rich Jewish industrialists and press barons using their power to help a child murderer escape justice. Watson's coverage flirted with ugly anti-Semitic stereotypes, but proved to be extremely popular in Georgia and served to stoke up the feeling against Frank and the Jewish community in Atlanta. It was even cited as one of the inspirations for the reformation of the KKK in the area. Unfortunately, this increasingly hysterical mood was about to spill out from the newspapers and onto the streets in shocking fashion. After all of his appeals failed, Leo Frank's supporters turned to State Governor John Slayton. Slayton had personally reviewed the case and come to the conclusion Frank was innocent. In the face of fierce opposition, 
Slayton made the fateful decision to commute Leo Frank's death sentence to life imprisonment. The men that came for Leo Frank as he sat on his bunk at Milledgeville Prison were remarkably solemn and organized for a mob. On the night of August 16, 1915, two dozen prominent Atlantan citizens calling themselves the Knights of Mary Fagan made the decision to use their southern prerogative and dispense what they saw as the rightful verdict of the court themselves. Armed with guns, they raided the jail and drove Frank 150 miles to the site of an oak grove in Mary's hometown of Marietta, where they lynched him from a tree. The last act of the mob, none of whom were ever charged with any crime, was to return Frank's wedding ring to his wife in accordance with his last words. The Leo Frank case had brought out the worst in everyone. Both Frank's supporters and opponents plumbed the depths in order to make their case in the wildly irresponsible newspaper coverage with rival titles trying to one-up each other with even more sensational stories only served to further enrage the mood. In recent years, there has been a growing feeling that Frank's case was a miscarriage of justice that spawned a shameful public murder. Whether prejudice played a part in his conviction is debatable. Frank was found unanimously guilty by three separate juries, some of whom were Jewish. However, some of the evidence that they used to declare Frank's guilt looks decidedly suspect. The crucial role of the janitor Jim Conley has come under particular scrutiny. The bloody shirt, his lies to the police, his admission that he wrote the so-called murder notes, and his rehearsed testimony at the trial make Conley stand out as the likely real murderer for many advocates of Frank's innocence. The unsettling case of Leo Frank had largely been forgotten by 1982, an undefying episode that was best left to fade away into obscurity. That was until Alonzo Mann came forward with a bombshell. As the pencil factory's office boy in 1913, he had seen Jim Conley moving Mary Fagan's corpse by himself. If true, it shredded a key part of the prosecution's evidence all those years ago. Did the testimony settle this most divisive of cases? Was Leo Frank innocent all along? As he approached the end of his life, 83-year-old Alonzo Mann decided to unburden himself of a dark secret that had haunted him for nearly 70 years. As Leo Frank's 14-year-old office boy in 1913, Mann had actually witnessed a co-worker trying to dispose of the body of Mary Fagan. Mann, who testified in the original trial that he left the pencil factory at 11.30 a.m. that day and did not witness anything, was now saying he returned at about 12.05 p.m. and saw the building's janitor, Jim Conley, carrying the limp body of Mary Fagan, about to throw her down the coal scuttle next to the elevator. According to Mann's 1982 testimony, Conley threatened to kill the boy if he told anyone what he had seen. Terrified, Mann ran home and told his parents what had happened. Keen not to get involved in something so horrific, Mann says his parents ordered him to say nothing of what he had seen to the police. Some critics have questioned Alonzo Mann's latter-day statements. Is it really credible that a white family in 1913 Atlanta would be reluctant to implicate a black man in the murder of a young white girl? It's a sound criticism, but if we take man's about turn at face value, it clearly is exculpatory for Leo Frank. The story the prosecution told at the trial was that Conley was an accomplice after the fact, helping Frank dispose of the body in the factory's basement. Alonzo Mann says he saw Conley with Fagan's body on his own, without Frank. Mann's 1982 story isn't the only reason to suspect Conley may have committed the murder himself. Conley was originally arrested because the pencil factory's day watchman had seen him washing red stains out of a shirt, but it was his ever-changing stories that convinced the police he had some involvement in the crime. Conley told them that he could not write so he could not be responsible for the two murder notes found near Fagan's body. Conley was quickly found out, though, when investigators found from co-workers 
that Conley could indeed write and had lied to the police about it. Under extensive interrogation from detectives, the janitor then gave at least four different versions of how Frank had coerced or bribed him into helping dispose of Fagan's body and write the notes to implicate night watchman Newt Lee. Whilst detectives seemed keen to believe his final version of Conley's story, it looks pretty implausible with any historical detachment. Frank was an intelligent, college-educated man, a white factory owner in the racist South of 1913. Would he really have hatched such a bizarre plot with a black employee and dictated the barely literate notes found with Fagan's body? The possibility that Conley had simply invented his story to try and defect the blame from himself seems more believable than what he told the court during the trial. It reads like the invention of an uneducated man who had not really thought through what he was doing. But stuck with his story, prosecutors did their best to burnish it. Conley was subjected to weeks of rehearsal, what prosecutor Hugh Dorsey called midnight seances. Together with police detectives, Dorsey and his team spent hours coaching Conley, smoothing out his story to be as convincing as possible. Conley was guided in the best way to engage jurors, to maintain eye contact and remain composed. Conley's lawyer, William Smith, took on the role of Leo Frank's attorney and role-played the fiercest possible cross-examination they could imagine Conley enduring, ensuring he had suitable rebuttals for anything he may be challenged on. And it worked. With Leo Frank's lawyers unable to deconstruct Conley's seemingly improbable account on the stand, his testimony did much to convict Frank in the eyes of the jury. With the context of Alonzo Mann's 1982 admission, the idea that Conley actually committed the murder on his own and wrote the notes to blame it on a fellow black man looks like a distinct possibility. The references to a night witch and Negro were widely believed to be an attempt to implicate the factory's night watchman, Newt Lee, for the crime. Lee was initially held by police after he discovered Mary's body but was later released and not thought to have been involved. These so-called murder notes are the most bizarre aspect of the crime, and the mentality of their writer hard to fathom. They were certainly written by Jim Conley. Investigators matched both the handwriting and the grammatical style to the janitor, rather than Leo Frank. But if Leo Frank had dictated them to Conley, as he claimed, it's hard to understand what an intelligent, sophisticated man like Frank hoped the strange notes would achieve. Both of the short messages, written in almost impenetrable broken English, are drafted to make them appear that they were penned by Mary Fagan herself. It's extremely difficult to believe a man like Frank would ever believe anybody would buy such a ludicrous notion. Fagan's body was found in a pitch-black basement, making it impossible for her to have written them. From Frank's encounters with Mary at the factory, he would also have known that she was bright and articulate hardly someone who would write such semi-literate gibberish. A further problem with Conley's scenario regarding the notes is he testified at the trial that Frank had ordered him to burn Fagan's body in the furnace to completely remove any trace of her from the factory. Conley claims he got drunk and never carried out that part of the plan, but if this was Frank's intention, then why would he need to dictate the notes at all? At the trial, Mary Fagan's murder was portrayed as sexually motivated. Leo Frank, the jury was told, was a pervert and deviant with a history of sexually harassing young female employees and even boys. The prosecution found a local landlady who said Frank had attempted to rent a room for himself and a young girl on the day of the murder. Thus, a persuasive picture was painted of a man who had murdered Fagan after he attempted to initiate a sexual liaison with her and she refused his advances. This scenario is undermined by the meager $1.20 wages Fagan had collected from the factory that day. When police found the girl's body, the money was missing. The man who had robbed her of her life and dignity had also stolen her wages. The motive for Leo Frank to steal Fagan's money is non-existent. $1.20 would have been a pittance for the well-paid factory boss from a wealthy family. 
and since Frank was accused of a sexual attack, the money was not an issue anyway. Unlike Frank, Conley did have a motive for robbing Fagan and admitted such at the trial. Conley was a drunkard and a serial debtor and even conceded under cross-examination at the trial that he would often flee his creditors by escaping from the same basement Fagan's body was found. Had Conley, already drunk by noon when Fagan came to collect her money, tried to rob the girl? Perhaps young Mary, feisty and strong-willed, had put up a fight and Conley had killed her in the ensuing struggle. Whatever the specifics, this scenario seems more credible than Leo Frank stealing such a small sum from the girl himself. A further possibility is that Frank and Conley removed the money as part of their supposed attempt to frame Newt Lee, but this is dependent on how credible you regard Conley's story about the notes. Jim Conley's testimony did more than anything to seal Leo Frank's fate. Yet one strange and unpleasant admission from Frank's supposed accomplice, largely overlooked at the time, appears to seriously contradict a key aspect of his story. Conley's startling claim was that he was in the habit of defecating in the elevator shaft and did so earlier on the morning of Saturday the 26th before the murder. When police first investigated the crime scene, they found the undisturbed human excrement, exactly as Conley described. The problem for the prosecution's case was that when detectives later operated the elevator, they discovered that its crude mechanism crushed the excrement when it stopped at the basement. But Conley had told the trial that he and Frank had used this elevator to carry Fagan's corpse to the basement, something that could not have occurred without also crushing the feces. The defense did not pursue this angle at the trial, perhaps because of its distasteful nature. It did, however, become a large part of subsequent attempts to posthumously clear Frank's name. Indeed, for some innocence advocates, the fecal matter in the elevator shaft is symbolic of the entire case against Leo Frank. In the aftermath of the murder, numerous witnesses testified that Leo Frank was behaving in an odd manner, unusually edgy and nervous to the extent that he was unable to perform simple tasks like unlocking a door or operating the factory time clock. The first witness to report Frank's strange demeanor was the night watchman, Newt Lee. Frank called Lee to the factory at around 4 p.m. on Saturday afternoon after the police believed Mary was killed but before the discovery of the body. This was unusually early according to Lee's normal routine. Lee noted that Frank appeared on edge at this meeting. Apologizing for calling him in early, Frank told Lee that he could come back in two hours. On his return at around 6 p.m., Frank appeared even more nervous and agitated. The factory boss attempted to punch a slip in the time clock, but struggled with the action that Lee had seen him perform normally on several occasions previously. It took him twice as long this time than it did the other times I saw him fix it. He fumbled, putting it in while I held the lever for him, Lee told the trial. An ex-employee, John Milton Gant, visited the factory at about the same time to retrieve a pair of shoes that he had left there. Gant also noticed how jumpy and nervous Frank appeared. Was Lee's odd demeanor because he had murdered Mary Fagan earlier that afternoon? Newt Lee also recalled how Frank had phoned him later that night whilst he was carrying out his duties as a night watchman, but before he had found the body of Mary Fagan. This was the first time Frank had ever called him like this, that appeared unusual to Lee. Was Leo Frank checking to see if the body had been discovered? After the police first contacted Leo Frank early on the morning following the murder, several officers were suspicious of just how nervous Frank appeared. Upon calling at Leo's home at around 7 a.m., both Detectives Black and Rogers were taken aback by Frank's evident distress. Black told the trial, Frank's voice was hoarse and trembling and nervous and excited. He looked to me like he was pale. He seemed nervous in handling his collar. He could not get his tie tied and talked very rapidly in asking what had happened. The officers informed Frank that Mary Fagan had been murdered, 
while in the car as they escorted him to the factory. Once there, he was shaking so badly that he had trouble unlocking doors and operating the elevator. Frank himself would later argue at the trial that he had a naturally nervous demeanor and his behavior was not unusual considering the circumstances. Clearly, this argument can be used both ways. If Frank was the murderer, then his edgy behavior is understandable, but also equally so if he was innocent and worried that the police may wrongly suspect him. Detectives, however, had more cause to be suspicious, not just because of Frank's manner, but because of his statements. On the Sunday after the murder, Frank told the police that he had no idea who Mary Fagan even was, an obvious lie that could only be read as a dishonest attempt by Frank to distance himself from the crime. Fagan had worked at her current job in the factory for over a year, and Frank would have encountered her on hundreds of occasions. Police found over 50 payslips signed by Leo Frank in which he had written Fagan's name. He also admitted that he spoke to the girl at noon on the day of her murder. Most remarkably, Frank would even try to implicate John Gant, a former factory employee, by telling police that Gant had been intimate with Mary in the past, signaling him out as a key suspect. Since Frank claimed not to know who Fagan was, it's hard to understand how he could have known this. Police later interviewed numerous witnesses who told them that they had seen Leo Frank talking to Mary on several occasions, further betraying his lie. What some of these witnesses told detectives would become a key plank of the case against him at the trial. An alarming number of witnesses would claim that Leo Frank had a penchant for harassing young women in his employ. Some advocates of Frank's innocence have argued that this testimony was largely tittle-tattle, suborned or exaggerated statements designed to portray Frank as a pervert capable of murdering a teenage girl who spurned his advances. However, the sheer number of people willing to say damaging things about the factory boss seems hard to countenance in the circumstances. Much has been made by Frank's supporters that anti-Semitism was the real reason the town turned on him, but this argument looks somewhat overstated. In 1913 Atlanta, as with the rest of the South, Jews were a relatively well-integrated and accepted part of the community. Essentially regarded as part of the white population, anti-Semitism was rare, and many Jews felt the favorable atmosphere in the South made it a refuge from the discrimination they often suffered in other parts of the country. Blacks, on the other hand, were treated as third-class citizens, stripped of many civic and legal rights, segregated, vilified, and often subject to brutal violence and oppression. Most of the thousands of lynchings that occurred in this period were of black men, often killed if there was even a suspicion that they had attempted to engage in relations with a white woman. In this context, it does not seem very likely that so many white Atlantans would be willing to commit perjury to see a fellow white man go to the gallows, instead of any of the several black suspects that were also arrested by police. The defense did not even attempt to cross-examine any of the teenage girls that testified at the trial that Leo Franks had made improper advances to them. Fourteen-year-old Nellie Pettis recounted how Frank had propositioned her for sex. Sixteen-year-old Nellie Wood would tell the court how Frank had pushed himself against her and touched her breast. Twenty girls in all gave similar testimony about Frank's impropriety. Several male employees also described how they had witnessed Frank rubbing himself against the young female workers. Whilst not proof of guilt of the murder, it's not hard to see how a conservative jury of the time would be predisposed against Frank in light of such testimony. There have been competing claims that various witnesses were got at, either bribed or coerced into false testimony by both the defense and prosecution teams. With allegations flying both ways, it's hard to know what to make of the testimony of people like Nina Formby, a rooming house owner who told the trial that Frank had telephoned her premises on the day of the murder to procure a room for himself and a young girl. Did Frank hope this girl would be Mary Fagan? Formby would eventually recant her testimony, claiming she'd made it up. 
However, some sources suggest Formby's boarding house was actually a child brothel, so the recantation may have been an attempt to protect her reputation. It's not an entirely outlandish allegation. The rooming house was in Atlanta's red light district, and child brothels were, sadly, a common feature in many southern towns at the time. Some of Frank's claims about his whereabouts around the time of the murder look suspect. He would tell police that he was in his office solidly from noon that day till at least 1235. During this time, around 1205, he says he handed over the $1.20 to Mary Fagan and saw her leave his office and talk to a girl outside. Much of his statement did not check out when investigators attempted to corroborate it. 14-year-old Montine Stover says she went up to Frank's office at around 12.10 that afternoon, and neither Frank or Fagan were there. Stover says she did not see or talk to Fagan at all that day, and the girl Frank says he saw talking to Fagan was never found despite an extensive search. When confronted with this evidence, Frank changed his story. Now he conceded he may have unconsciously left his office between 12.05 and 12.10 to visit the metal room across the hallway from his office. This admission looked bad for Frank, as investigators had found blonde hair twisted around a lathe handle in the room and blood splatter on the floor, leading them to believe this was where Fagan had actually been killed. The metal room also housed the knurling department, where Mary Fagan worked, knitting the metal bands around the rubbers on the end of the pencils. This led prosecutors to speculate that Frank had used some pretense to lure Fagan to the room in order to make a sexual advance on her. Some 40 men across three separate juries voted unanimously against Leo Frank back in 1915. All of his appeals were rejected. At the summation of the prosecution case, lawyer Hugh Dorsey gave a stirring pro-Jewish speech and rubbish accusations that anti-Semitism had played any part in his case at all. Dorsey had a reputation as a moderate liberal and was not prone to demagoguery. Noted historian Albert Lindemann has written extensively on Jewish history and anti-Semitism and believes the jury convicted based on the quality of Dorsey's arguments. The case that Dorsey built against Frank was not based in any overt way upon anti-Semitism. Five Jews sat on the grand jury that indicted Frank. It seems safe to conclude that they were persuaded by the concrete evidence that Dorsey presented, not by his pandering to anti-Jewish feeling. The case itself probably was decided by evidence, however flawed, rather than prejudice. But the poisonous war of words that surrounded the trial and its aftermath culminating in the infamous events at the Oak Grove in Marietta created a lasting legacy of resentment and paranoia which soured relations with the Jewish community in Atlanta for decades. With overstated claims from Leo Frank's supporters and ugly anti-Semitic slurs from his detractors, neither side comes out of this tragic affair well. As for what really happened that Saturday afternoon in 1913, only two men know for sure. They are Leo Frank and Jim Connolly. Credible cases can be made for both men's guilt, whereas equally viable arguments exist for their innocence. Frank was eventually pardoned in 1986 by the Georgia State Board of Pardons and Paroles, who did not exonerate Frank but acknowledged their failure to protect him from his lynching. That brutal event ended any chance that Frank would ever get justice on earth but the Ballad of Mary Fagan, a then popular folk song inspired by the case, supposed that Frank's ultimate judgment may be faced somewhere else. Quote, Have a notion in my head, when Frank he comes to die, stand examination in a courthouse in the sky. town is standard, a small Midwestern town where nothing ever happens. Quiet, peaceful, and tucked away among the cornfields and away from the dangers of the outside world. Unfortunately, there was nothing normal about standard. 
there has been an evil that has been awakened, and now the residents are slowly going crazy. Men for no reason are coming home and murdering their families, and dark forms are appearing in people's mirrors. The evil is spreading, and now it's up to ex-Chicago cop Rob Aletto to find it. Time is running out, and the neighbors are becoming quiet shadows as they watch him. He doesn't have long before it'll start to get into his mind, and then he himself would be making that deadly trip home. Inside the Mirrors by Jason R. Davis, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample or purchase the title on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. On the evening of March 19, 1960, police were summoned to a ranch-style home in Independence, Missouri, 10 miles due east of Kansas City. There, a young housewife claimed she heard a gun go off in the bedroom where her husband, James Kinn, had been sleeping. Upon entering, she said she found her young daughter, Dana, holding a 22 caliber pistol and her husband shot in the back of the head. The victim was loaded into an ambulance. By the time he arrived at the hospital, Sharon Kin's husband was dead. After an investigation in which the toddler proved she could indeed pull a trigger on a 22 caliber pistol, the police declared James Kin's death an accident. Kin was free to go, but she would soon be under suspicion again. In April of that year, using money from her husband's insurance policy, Sharon Kin purchased a Ford Thunderbird from a car salesman named Walter Jones. The two hit it off and soon began an affair. Their relationship was troubled right from the start. Jones was married at the time to a woman named Patricia. In May, Kin requested Jones join her on a trip. Jones declined. Upon her return at the end of May, Kin informed Jones she was pregnant with his child. She expected he would leave his wife. Instead, Jones broke off their relationship. Not long after that, Patricia Walter Jones' wife went missing. After filing a missing persons report, Jones spoke with Patricia's friends in hopes of uncovering clues as to the whereabouts of his wife. One group who carpooled to work with Patricia had an intriguing story to tell. They informed him that Patricia had received a mysterious phone call on the day of her disappearance. The caller was female and wished to speak with her after work. Patricia agreed to the meeting, asking her carpool driver to drop her off at a meetup spot in Independence. They confirmed that a woman was waiting for Patricia. Jones confronted Kin. She admitted she had indeed met with Patricia that day and told her about the affair. Afterward, Kin claimed she dropped her off near the Jones household. Jones, dubious, demanded Kin come clean. Kin stuck with her story, claiming innocence. She even enlisted an old high school lover named John Boldiz to help search for Patricia. Sure enough, the pair quickly discovered Patricia Jones' body, riddled with bullets, in a remote area outside of town. Police questioned Sharon Kin, John Boldiz, and Jones, and subsequently arrested Kin for the murder of Patricia Jones. What's more, they announced that Kin would also be tried for the murder of her husband, James Kin. But Sharon Kin was pregnant, and the trials would have to wait until she delivered her baby. Kin was tried separately for each murder. The trial for the murder of Patricia Jones began in June 1961. The media soon arrived to cover the sensational case. In the end, citing a lack of concrete evidence, the jury found Kin not guilty of Jones's murder. One juror even asked for Kin's autograph after the verdict was read a moment captured by photographers. The trial for her husband James Kin's murder, however, proved far more complicated. The first trial in January 1962 ended in a conviction, yet the verdict of life behind bars was overturned due to procedural irregularities. A second trial ended abruptly in a mistrial, 
while a third trial in July 1964 ended in a hung jury, allowing Kin out on bond. Before her fourth trial could begin in October 1964, Kin skipped town and headed to Mexico with a boyfriend named Francis Puglis. She claimed they intended to get married there, but Kin just couldn't resist another violent episode. After meeting an American tourist, Francisco Parades Ordonez, in a bar, Kin went back to his hotel room with him. She claimed he tried to rape her and she shot him, killing him and wounding a hotel employee who entered the room after he heard gunshots. A return on ballistics revealed that the gun that killed Ordonez was the same gun that had killed Patricia Jones. Mexican police didn't believe Kin's protests about attempted rape and tried her for homicide. In October 1965, she was convicted and received a 10-year prison sentence. A subsequent appeal and judicial review had an adverse effect on Kin's case, extending her sentence to 13 years, claiming the first had been too lenient. Kin spent the next four years in a Mexican prison earning the nickname La Pistolera, the gunfighter. Then on December 7, 1969, Sharon Kin didn't show up for the daily roll call in prison. By the next morning, it was obvious she had escaped. Some believe she bribed the guards and made her escape during a convenient blackout the night before. Others believe her boyfriend aided in her escape. One lurid theory claims that the family of her last victim busted her out of jail for the pleasure of killing her themselves. The FBI worked in tandem with Mexican authorities entertained a brief search for Ken, claiming that it was unlikely she would return to the United States and had instead probably made her way to Guatemala. Ken's warrant for the murder of her husband James, issued in 1964, is still active to this day, making it the longest outstanding arrest warrant in the Kansas City area and one of the longest outstanding felony warrants in United States history. Sharon Ken's good looks and sensational story made her a larger-than-life figure in the press at the time. Now that over 40 years have passed, with Kin on the lam, it's obvious that she is no common criminal. La Pistolera is likely still out there somewhere. On July 8, 1878, one of the strangest murder plots in Pennsylvania history began with the purchase of four insurance policies in Lebanon County. It would become a plan that took months to carry out. The perpetrators believed it was foolproof. Four men bought life insurance policies on a man named Joseph Raber, an old recluse who lived in a shack in the Blue Mountains. The elderly man was in poor health, and they were sure he would soon die bringing an end to their financial problems. But when they decided that Raber had lived too long, they took matters into their own hands by bringing two others into the plan. Unfortunately, far too many people knew of the plot, and soon all six were arrested for murder. The trial gained national attention, perhaps for the similarities between the six conspirators. All were illiterate, all were living in poverty, and all six had blue eyes. In time, the sinister plot would create legends and inspire crime writers, but it also had one unintended effect. It created a lingering spirit that still haunts a local churchyard to this day. The life insurance policies on Joseph Raber should have earned the policy owners a large payday for 1878. They totaled more than $8,000 and ensured the life of a man who his killers believed should have been dead already. Raber was an impoverished old man who lived in an old charcoal burner's shack in the mountains. He was too ill to work and dependent on charity of others to survive. Officially, charity was just what his four neighbors, Israel Brandt, George Zeckman, Josiah Hummel, and Henry Wise were offering him. The type of insurance they bought was called assessment insurance also known as graveyard insurance. It was primarily sold to guarantee that the insured would have enough money to be buried when he died 
with a little extra for his survivors. The concept of assessment insurance was simple. The insured paid a premium to join a pool, then when any of the members died, the rest in the pool were assessed a certain amount that was then given to the beneficiaries. But Reber was relatively healthy and showed no signs that he would be dying anytime soon. The constant assessments required to stay in the pools quickly became a financial hardship for his insurers. They realized that they could not afford to let Joseph Raber live any longer. Just a few months after the paperwork was signed, the four conspirators hired two assassins to kill Joseph Raber. Israel Branch approached his neighbor, Charles Drew, and offered him $300 to kill the old man and promised he would get the same amount from the other conspirators after the job was done. Drews, in turn, sought help from Frank Stichler, a local thief, the final blue-eyed man. Around dusk on Saturday, December 7, 1878, Drews went into the tavern that was located at Israel Brandt's hotel and told people there that Joseph Raber was dead. That afternoon, he and Stichler had paid a call on Raber and offered him some tobacco if he would accompany them to Kreiser's store. Raber agreed to go with them. The trip to the store had required crossing Indian Town Creek on a crude bridge made of two 12-inch planks. Drews said Raber had a dizzy spell partway across, fell into the water, and drowned. The following day, a coroner's jury examined the body and declared the death accidental. But no one was fooled for long. Too many people in Lebanon County knew about the plot, and word eventually reached the insurance company that had provided the policies. They pressed the local police for answers. They soon had a witness to what had occurred on the crude bridge. A man named Joseph Peters had witnessed Stilcher shoving Raber into the water and then holding him under until he drowned. Soon, all six men had been arrested. Newspapers in America and overseas followed the case. It was the first time in the history of English and American law that six men would be tried together for murder. Reporters from distant cities came to the Lebanon County Courthouse to witness the proceedings. One of them observed that all of the defendants had piercing blue eyes. From then on, referred to them as the Blue-Eyed Six. The unusual nature of the crime and the striking nickname given to their killers inspired Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes story, The Red-Headed League. After five hours of deliberations by the jury, all six were found guilty of the murder in April 1879, though one of the conspirators, George Seckman, was later granted a second trial and acquitted due to lack of direct evidence against him. The remaining five were sentenced to death by hanging. A number of legends appeared in the wake of the Blue-Eyed Six case, some more based on facts than others. One tale claimed that the killers were all buried next to Joseph Raber in a local cemetery, while others claimed the men were actually hanged from a tree in the cemetery. In truth, Raber was buried there, but his killers were all hanged at the county prison and buried in various graveyards in the region. In time, the legends that surrounded the burial site of Joseph Raber have been the most enduring. He was buried at Moonshine Cemetery, which is on land that was donated by Henry Moonshine, a local man who offered the land in memory of his son, who died at the age of 14. The cemetery is adjacent to the United Zion Church, which started out as a log cabin. It burned in the 1960s and was replaced by the white building that still exists there today. It is a quiet, peaceful place. There is nothing strange or eerie about it, at least in the daytime. After dark, visitors tell a different story. They believe that the spirit of the murdered Joseph Raber still walks the grounds of the place where he was buried. Mysterious lights have been seen in the cemetery. Some say there are six blue lights that are seen, which are the ghosts of the blue-eyed six paying penance for their crimes. But most claim to have seen the ghost of Raber himself wandering through the cemetery. They believe that, even after all this time, the murdered man cannot rest in peace.
Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.